Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for our first ever Virginia Hospital Center Stakeholders Briefing sponsored by the VHC Foundation. Our community is in the midst of the deadliest health pandemic in 100 years. There may not be a more important time to hear from your regional community hospital. That's why we'll spend the next few minutes together discussing our current healthcare reality, including what we've learned about the coronavirus and what VHC is doing to ensure the best care is available to all our patients today, tomorrow, and in the near future. So let's start at the top. Jim Cole, VHC president and CEO is our first guest. So Jim, can you share some perspective looking back over the past 100 days as to how VHC as a community health system has performed in dealing with this pandemic? Well, Tony, as you know, COVID-19 is a Nova virus. That means it was new. There was a great deal that was unknown. And I would say within the course of about 48 hours, um, our world here at Virginia Hospital Center changed dramatically as we learned rapidly from the CDC how to best protect our patients, protect the community, and, and care for our patients. I mean, one of our uh, first steps was basically in order to stop the spread to unfortunately uh, prohibit visitors. Then we set up screening for anyone who came into the, page, into the hospital uh, to ensure that we did temperature checks, um, screening for symptoms, et cetera. And frankly, the, the first few weeks was, um, there was a lot of effort into simply obtaining adequate personal protective equipment, masks, gowns, et cetera, for our staff. Uh, fortunately, we were very successful very early on in securing adequate supplies, uh, thanks to our materials management department and, and frankly, the generous donations from many community members. Uh, that that's a good, that's a good um, jumping off point, uh, Jim. Many individuals and organizations have generously given to the hospital in support of our COVID-19 response. As you mentioned, uh, PPE, as well as cash contributions and meals. Can you share with us how this has impacted uh, our frontline healthcare workers and support service team members? Absolutely. I mean, first at the most basic level, it's enabled those who provide the care to feel safe themselves. You know, um, as I said, this was new and frankly scary to a lot of people. But knowing that we had adequate gloves, gowns, proper mask, so that our staff could care at, at one point for over 150 COVID inpatients and know that <clears throat> through the donation of, of supplies and the funds to buy those supplies, that they could safely provide that care. And the end result was very, very few of our healthcare workers contracted COVID from being here at the hospital. And then the other aspect of it is psychologically, the outpouring of, uh, of food, simply food, to know you had lunch every day, su supplied by a restaurant or a member of the community as a way of simply saying, Thank you, nurse. Thank you, physician. Thank you, technician, for what you're doing for our community. That was such a tremendous and ongoing morale boost for all of our staff. Well, the generosity of this community in support of Virginia Hospital Center is nothing new. Uh, you know, you can't round a corner here on this campus without running into a donor plaque or some recognition of philanthropy. Uh, can you speak to the role of philanthropy as it relates to what we're doing with the outpatient pavilion. Well, I'll go back even further, Tony. Okay. I, I have to remind you that Virginia Hospital Center, Arlington Hospital, began with volunteers and a bake sale. So philanthropy and the community is, is the root of Virginia Hospital Center. You know, we're, we are the only independent healthcare system in this entire region. And I think a reason for that is a strong sense of uh, community ownership 
and likewise the staff feeling a strong sense of obligation to this community. So we're, we're, we're rooted in a mutual sense of ownership with the community and philanthropy. Obviously, that's led to great success for this organization. Uh, we're one of the top hospitals in the country. Uh, outstanding quality is recognized by health grades, CMS five-star rating. And all of that has led to uh, a demand for more inpatient beds. You know, the quality has been recognized, more patients have come, and that is what led to the outpatient pavilion project. Two, two fundamental objectives. One was to move space out of the current tower to permit us to add more inpatient beds to meet that demand. And second, to provide a totally improved experience for outpatients. Uh, the outpatient pavilion will be, a, be the location of our physician offices, outpatient surgery, outpatient imaging, with dedicated parking in and, in and out, and totally designed to enhance the, the outpatient experience. None of that would be possible in this age of uh, economic uncertainty uh, without the ongoing and generous contributions from our donors. Let me, let me pull out a couple of things that you talked about. Independence, high uh, level of uh, care, and also a exceptional uh, patient experience. Those are all three things that separate Virginia Hospital Center. And in fact, um, put Virginia Hospital Center uh, on the radar of the Mayo Clinic. And um, it's my understanding about five years ago, you and the leadership team here made the decision to accept an invitation from the Mayo Clinic to become part of the Mayo Clinic Care Network. So can you tell me a little bit how, a little bit about how being a member of the Mayo Clinic Care Network benefits our patients and our clinicians? Yes. And as you know, Virginia Hospital Center is the only health system in the entire mid-Atlantic region to be a member of the Mayo Clinic Care Network. And that membership provides us with clinical expertise as well as, as research access. Probably the most meaningful direct impact for any patient is that any patient of a physician at Virginia Hospital Center can obtain a second opinion from a Mayo Clinic expert hmm. at no cost to the patient, no cost to the physician. Uh, and it's proven a, an invaluable asset to hundreds of patients each and every year over those five years. And then most recently, during the uh, COVID crisis epidemic, we've been able to participate in Mayo uh, research protocols uh, related to plasma and studies with remdesivir and gain access to, to, to drugs and plasma on an expedited basis. So during the height of the pandemic, um, to ensure that there was ample supplies and uh, capacity to take care of COVID-19 patients, you know, the governor had made a decision to uh, uh, ask the hospitals across the Commonwealth to discontinue other medical procedures. And so for a number of weeks, um, Virginia Hospital Center was unavailable, un unable to right, provide right. any additional care. Um, now that's been lifted. Uh, so tell, tell people, is it safe to come back and should they come back? Uh, it's absolutely safe to come back. And for those who have chronic medical conditions, it's unsafe to not come back to see your physician. Uh, on the hospital campus, uh, as, as I'd mentioned earlier, we have uh, obviously screening for visitors, temperature checks, etc. If a patient is admitted to the hospital, every patient is tested for COVID-19 immediately. Uh, for patients requiring surgical procedures and certain other procedures, we have immediate COVID testing. And it, it's so important to understand that in physician offices, 
there is adequate PPE now. Uh, there's social distancing. There is the option of telehealth visits. And I'm sure we've all heard, uh, unfortunately, tragic stories in recent weeks of patients with chronic conditions who, who have deferred seeing their physicians, deferred coming to the emergency room, and suffered tragic consequences. So the time is now to get back into your routine healthcare regimen, to see your physician, to have those procedures that are necessary. So last question, um, this is about you. Um, you know, beginning of the calendar year, uh, you had announced that um, uh, 2020 was gonna be your last year as CEO uh, of Virginia Hospital Center. Uh, but then the world, as you said, turned upside down. So uh, could you share with us your intentions uh, as it relates to the request from our board of directors? Certainly. Well, as we said, COVID-19 changed many things, and among them were my personal plans. Uh, obviously, when we began dealing with COVID, there were so many unknowns. Uh, it certainly disrupted the recruiting process for my successor. And uh, frankly, we still face some unknowns from COVID. Uh, we don't know if there's going to be a second wave or a third wave. Um, we've had to maintain uh, uh, a very active stat, uh, standing. So the board asked me to d defer my retirement until the end of 2021. And I intend to do that. And uh, it's great to continue to work with uh, our great team of physicians, staff, executive team here, and to work with a board uh, that has such a great vision for excellence. So I look forward to working through 2021 and uh, ensuring that we're on a good footing when my successor takes, takes over. Well, that's great news. I know the people in the community are going to be pleased to hear that. So I do want to thank you, Jim, for spending time with us this afternoon and look forward to talking to you next time. Thank you, Tony. From the C-suite to the clinical panel, we look forward to talking to our clinical leaders who have been fighting the battle against COVID-19. Dr. Jeff DeLisi will be leading that panel. Dr. DeLisi, take it away. Good afternoon. My name is Jeff DeLisi, and I'm the Senior Vice President and Chief Medical Officer here at Virginia Hospital Center. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us here this afternoon. I'm really honored to be joined by a couple of my colleagues on the medical staff here at Virginia Hospital Center. To my left is Dr. Mary Margaret Lewis, who's the medical director of the intensive care unit at Virginia Hospital Center. Dr. Rohit Modak, medical director of infection prevention. And Dr. Jennifer Permeggi, another one of our infectious disease physicians. I think one of the things that has really made this a successful response to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic is that we are a community independent hospital. We've been able to be nimble. We've been able to make decisions quickly, act on things happening, and take great care of our patients. And we've seen some great results because of that. Just a couple highlights of the last few months here. We were the first area hospital to stand up a drive-through testing center in Northern Virginia, now not just Northern Virginia, the DC area. And we've tested over 5,000 patients through that drive through center now. We knew it was important to get that implemented because we couldn't have all those patients necessarily coming to our ER, coming into our outpatient lab. We wanted a safe, convenient way to test the patients, and we were able to stand that up in just about a week. Second, we were able to use, again, our independent status to make some really quick decisions and get ourselves enrolled in some major trials very quickly. We were just one of 180 sites globally to be part of the remdesivir trial with Gilead. I'm sure a lot of you have seen in the news some of the exciting results that we've seen from that. Patients who get remdesivir were shown to be able to get out of the hospital a little bit more quickly. We were one of the sites that helped prove that, and we're really honored and excited to be part of that. In addition, we've been one of the sites participating in the Mayo Clinic's convalescent plasma trial. What this means is they take uh, blood from patients who have evidence that they were infected by COVID and have antibodies to it. We get that blood, they take some plasma from it, and then we infuse it to patients that have uh, COVID-19. 
We've actually administered it to already over 60 patients. We're really excited about that. Third, we were one of the first hospitals in the area to get the Abbott Rapid ID test. And what we've done with this is been able to implement rapid testing for lots of patients coming through our hospital. Anybody admitted and anybody having any kind of procedure, whether that's a surgery, an endoscopy, a colonoscopy, a cardiac catheterization, a bronchoscopy, or an interventional radiology procedure, all of those patients are tested on the day of their procedure. And this is really important for a couple reasons. First, if you're going to have a surgery, if you have COVID, and we can find that out, as long as that surgery is not really emergent, we can safely delay the surgery. And what nobody wants is to have to recover from a surgery at the same time they're getting symptoms from COVID. So we think it's so important. And we're seeing about 2% of our population actually testing positive for that. So we're able to very safely do procedures for our patients and for our staff. And we're really excited about that. The end product of all of this has been some really great results. And I'm excited to talk to my colleagues here a little bit more about it this afternoon. One, one statistic that we're really excited about is although we've been taking care of up to 110 patients with COVID in our hospital on any given day, we've only had six staff members infected with COVID out of over 3,000 people. That's an infection rate of 0.2%. We're really proud of that. Secondly, when we look at our mortality rate, the number of patients that have passed who had COVID in our hospital, we've had over about 700 admissions our mortality rate looks to be about 10% lower than the national average. Nationally, it's 22, 23%. We're at 13%. And that means that these doctors right here have helped save the lives of over 50 or 60 people, additional lives, people who might not, patients who might not be alive today if they weren't treated here at Virginia Hospital Center. So we're really excited about that. And I'm excited to have my colleagues here to talk to you a little bit about some of the things that we've been doing over the last couple months to get those great results. So maybe I'll start with Dr. Lewis. Dr. Lewis, can you talk to us a little bit about some of the changes in care that we've been able to implement here at VHC over the last couple of months? And I'm thinking about some of the different things we do in terms of oxygenating patients versus what we used to do for patients that didn't have COVID. Yeah, so we've, we've implemented a lot of different things um, since, since the time of COVID. Um, one of, when we've demonstrated amazing teamwork, I've been so impressed with the teamwork between the nurses, the respiratory therapists, physical and occupational therapists and physicians. And then also within different physician groups, we work very, very closely with our ID, our infectious disease colleagues. And, um, and then with our other colleagues, the anesthesiologists, the interventional radiologists, the um, emergency department physicians. So one of the things that we did right at the beginning was we established some specific types of teams to help us out with these patients. And um, an airway team was established with the anesthesiologists so that any time a patient was having diff too much difficulty breathing and needed to be on a ventilator, the anesthesiologists would immediately come and provide that um, that procedure for us, and that helped because it was all it was all um, systematically put put in place um, and very safe, and um, being done by the most experienced operators in the hospital. Um, another thing that we did was we put a line team in place, and so the interventional radiologists immediately helped out with these patients that are so sick and on the ventilators, able to they've. They've stepped up and will place the, the lines, the large catheters that are needed to deliver these medications to the patients, um, and they're doing that very quickly for us. Um, the, these, the patients uh, that go on ventilators are very, very ill, and um, it often takes a long time to recover from COVID. Um, one of the things that we are doing um, is called proning the patient. So it's very simple. Most of the time, people are laying in a hospital bed, sort of sitting up in their hospital bed. But now um, we're very frequently kind of making, have, rolling them over and having them lay on their stomachs. And that helps um, provide better oxygen for the patients. And they end up doing much, much better if they can spend the majority of the day on their stomachs as opposed to their backs. 
You know, uh, I'm going to turn to Dr. Permeggia next. I think um, I wouldn't ask all three of them this question. I, I do have all their cell phone numbers, and they've been on speed dial for me for the last three months, and they've received countless phone calls uh, from from me over the over the course of this pandemic. And Dr. Permeggia, can you talk to talk to us a little bit about the progression that happened? I mean, I, I was just thinking back here as you know, we're we're all sitting here and reflecting on the last couple months to one of those first weekends of this pandemic hit and. Remember, I'm remembering getting texts from you about every patient that might have COVID coming into the emergency room. And then just a short couple weeks later, we had 60, 70, 80 patients admitted with definitive COVID. Talk to us about that. I mean, all three of you have been truly the leaders of our medical staff in treating these patients. Just talk to us a little bit about that progression that happened. Thank you, Dr. DeLisi. I think for, for us, it was always a when, not if. I remember we all got together and regrouped right after the um, New Year's break. And we said, you know, what about that coronavirus, that respiratory virus in China? Do we have a plan yet? We are going to see this. And we followed the media coverage. We followed what was being reported out of China. And again, we were already reading and preparing. We said, we will see this. It's just a question of when. Um, and, you know, one of the first rules of pandemics is by the time you realize you have a problem, it's too late. Um, I think one of the first cases in the United States was reported in January, but we're already hearing of people who've had positive serology and were ill before the new year. So we already had a problem. So we knew the situation would snowball pretty rapidly. Um, I saw, I want to say it was early January, um, maybe mid-January, a couple students who had come back from Wuhan um, who had been studying and were able to get some of the last flights out to return uh, to college here. And so that was a good trial run for the PPE and uh, for the personal protective equipment to make sure we had supplies on hand and our processes. And after that, it, it really snowballed rapidly. I would say the first wave that we saw uh, involved a number of patients with symptoms, but at that point, uh, the health department uh, was set the rules for testing. And so we told most of these patients, go home. Uh, we can't test you. You probably have this. Quarantine, uh, self-isolate, um, and come back if you feel more ill. And, you know, learning about the virus and how it progressed, we knew that a lot of patients got better, but some patients would continue to progress over about seven to ten days and a number of those patients came back and I recall I was on call the weekend in mid-March and um, it, we had an exponential increase in just a few days I remember walking into the ICU that weekend and it was full the ICU was full and luckily we were prepared we had been preparing for months so we were prepared well thanks thanks for uh all of your leadership in getting us prepared. You know, Dr. Permeggia mentioned the testing and, and how those first weeks we had to rely on the state to do the testing. We've now crossed at Virginia Hospital Center. I mentioned the 5,000 patients through the drive-through, but we've also tested an additional 5,000 patients in our hospital. So we have tested now over 10,000 patients for COVID uh, here at Virginia Hospital Center. Dr. Modak, ne next question for you. Um, one of the things that has been so invaluable with, with your leadership, we have had twice daily, we had twice daily calls uh, with, with kind of the leadership of the hospital for about six or seven weeks. We've only recently uh, kind of taken that back to once a day, but we still have once a day calls. Dr. Modak's been on every single call and his input has been absolutely invaluable. One of the things I, I talked about was our, our very low staff infection rate. And I think that goes to our management of the personal protective equipment or PPE that you've heard so much about in the news, N95 masks, gowns, gloves. Uh, and our purchasing team has done a spectacular job, I think, in getting those supplies to keep our staff uh, safe. But Dr. Moto, can you talk us through a little bit about the PPE policies that we've put in place? And then I think also, so we've got, uh, you know, a big group that's listening to this panel. What are the most important things that people can do out in the community to keep themselves safe? Because I think that's really important. I mean, they see all of us wearing masks. What's important for them to continue to do to keep themselves safe? That's a great question, Jeff. So like the testing, like our approach to this virus, to these patients, our approach to personal protective equipment, PPE, has evolved over the last three months as well. 
In the beginning, it was very scary. We couldn't test people. We saw there were shortages of personal protective equipment across the country. We had a supply. We didn't know if we were going to get any more. It was very daunting. And our staff was scared. And besides worrying about these patients, I'll tell you, I know all of us were very worried about our staff. And, and that kept, us, kept me awake at night. I know it kept all of you guys awake at night as well. How can we protect our staff? When we had outbreaks before, when we had Ebola in 2015, we only had one potential patient that turned out not even to have it in our hospital. When we had um, H1N1 or swine flu in 2009, you know, we never had issues about protecting our staff. We felt confident. We had enough PPE. We thought we could do it. All of a sudden, this was a new era. You, we were seeing what was happening in New York City on the media, on the news, that people were running out of PPE, that healthcare workers were getting infected. Everyone in our hospital was asking, and appropriately so, why can't we wear N95 masks everywhere? Why can't we have full PPE covering head to toe to protect ourselves? And the answer was, we didn't know if that was necessary, and we would be using a lot of PPE, and we didn't know if we would get any more. So it may protect us for the first week or two, but what happens after that? One thing that we did well, I think, was realize that this is not a two-week problem. This is not something that's going to come hit us and go away. That we are going to be dealing with COVID for the weeks and the months and potentially over a year to come. And we need to be very judicious with our PPE. So when that happens, we look to the science. And I again, I applaud our administration and our hospital and the medical staff and employees for understanding this. And I don't think this happens at a lot of hospitals. If you saw what was happening in the beginning of March, a lot of hospitals were willy-nilly using PPE. If someone had a random idea, they would just do it and then change policies in two days and change policies in two days. And it, it didn't instill any confidence in any of the staff. So I think what we were able to do is really look at the science. How is this disease transmitted? And like all respiratory viruses, one, two, and three are hands, hands, hands. We have to be good with hand hygiene. Number two, it's respiratory. We have to protect ourselves with masks. Was it appropriate to mask all employees? And initially, it wasn't. We didn't know if we had supplies. It also wasn't as prevalent in our community. We were seeing numbers go up, but we weren't there yet. Eventually, we did get to that point where we said, yes, let's mask all employees. Eventually, we got to the point where we said, let's mask all patients. There was certainly an evolution. I think the important part is to explain what we did well was explain to our staff why we were doing certain things. And like you mentioned in the beginning, I think it's very important we remain nimble. That if there was a suggestion from anyone, how can we make this safer, we did it. And we're still looking at that. Uh, Dr. DeLisi brought up a policy at Mayo Clinic, something that they do to help protect their staff, and we're looking into it. We may adopt that in the next couple of days. We never say, okay, we're doing a great job, our staff is not getting infected, that's that. We're always looking to improve. How can we make it safer? What's coming? What can we do to keep it safe and keep everyone feeling safe? Not just staying safe, but feeling safe. And it's very important. And part of that is early testing, is being available to everyone, explaining to people. You asked a very good um, second question. How can the general population stay safe? And I think this comes back to what we were saying. How did we protect our employees? So we did that a couple of ways. Number one, as I mentioned, hand hygiene. So generally, washing your hands, that's, that cannot be stressed enough. That's how people are going to stay safe. Number two, mask. We mask in the hospital, we need to mask at home. We need to mask when we're within six feet of people. That is going to protect us. It's gonna protect them, it's gonna protect us if everyone wears a mask. That's not negotiable. Number three, social distancing. It's important to stay six feet away. It's not okay to say, well, I'll just pick a couple of families and be close to them and it's okay because those families are picking a couple of families and very soon it's spreading throughout everyone. Maintain six feet distance. And finally, I mean, it's not something that we can really, or the population can do themselves, but I think testing is very important. That we need to test everyone we can um, if they have symptoms. Because if you can identify someone with symptoms early, we can isolate that person and they won't spread it. And that has to be our culture. That has to really be in our DNA, in our society. If we say, yes, we are going to protect my fellow colleagues, my other citizens, that's going to be huge in terms of protecting all of us and really limiting the spread of this virus. Thanks, Dr. Modak. You know, one other thing I want to mention about my colleagues here is one of the things that has just so impressed and uh, humbled me is the, these three not only work 
tirelessly all day long. But when they go home at night, that's when they're spending time looking at the literature, reading what's out there, looking at their specialty society message boards to find out what other people are doing. I can't tell you the number of times I heard on the phone during one of these calls. Well, I was reading, you know, last night and I found out this and I think we should do uh, this differently. And uh, it's just a real credit to all three of you of how hard you've worked to stay up with what was going on. And I know I'm thankful. I know our patients, our community are thankful as well for, for all the work that you've done. Dr. Lewis, next question for you. I think another thing that is that's out there right now in the community that people wonder is, is it safe to come to the hospital? I don't think I have COVID, but you know, maybe I'm having chest pain. Should I come? Should I not come? But I know you could probably comment on that because you see the sickest of the sick patients in the ICU, and you've probably seen a little less of that over the last two months. But talk to us about the safety of coming to the hospital, and should people come if, if they have symptoms of non-COVID uh, diseases? Yeah, that's a good question because I think initially there were a lot of people that were not coming to the hospital despite having very sig- or having symptoms of very significant diseases like heart attacks or strokes. And oftentimes that led to worse outcomes for those people because they were so afraid to come to the hospital. Um, and so I think, you know, it, it with the, with with our use of PPE, as we've described here, it is very safe to come to the hospital and it is very important to come to the hospital when you have these alarming symptoms so that we can address, you know, diagnose and address a disease that we can help and improve upon so that you can survive and have a very good outcome. So very important to come. Thanks. And then Dr. Permeggi, maybe you could comment a little bit. Again, the same sort of questions I think are out there about coming to an outpatient visit? Should I go see my primary care doctor? Should I go see my cardiologist? Is it safe? And maybe can you talk a little bit about some of the things that we put in place in our own physician group to to keep patients safe? Yes. So, you know, piggybacking on what Dr. Lewis had mentioned, um, people still present with very severe disease, and this disease often uh, manifests with more subtle symptoms early. Um, and not everything can be managed in a telephone call or even a virtual visit. Uh, there's importance to a physical examination. Some of those clues can be picked up early and the patients can get the appropriate lab testing and imaging that they need. In the office, um, we have protocols in place to keep us all safe. Much like in the hospital, we are using personal protective equipment and we ask that patients remain masked as well. We will have temperature screening in addition when they come in. Um, So we can safely physically examine a patient and treat them in the outpatient setting. Thanks. So my final question, and then maybe I'll ask for some some closing thoughts that maybe Dr. Modak can can answer this. Are we going to get back to normal or is this a new normal? Will we get back to a pre-COVID? What would it take to get back to pre-COVID? I don't think we're ever going to get back to a pre-COVID normal, but I don't think this is our new normal either. So if COVID was eliminated, if we had a vaccine that was 99% effective, yes, I think we could get back to something like what was there pre-COVID. But really, we're looking at a vaccine that maybe will give us 60 to 70% immunity. We'll get herd immunity. Most people won't get it. There may still be some. Um, I think there's lessons to be learned here because even if we handle COVID as a country, as a world globally, if we handle it well and we eliminate its threat, what is the next virus? I think that's the lesson that we've been talking, we talk about with every outbreak, but it's now in all of our faces that even after this, what's going to happen in a few years? What's next? So we need to learn some lessons. We need to learn lessons. You know, what can we do here? Number one, we can wash our hands. I don't think we're going to be in a situation where we wear masks for the rest of our life, where we can't go outside, where we have to have appointments to get into a store. I think we will return to some kind of normalcy. But is it really necessary um, for a restaurant to put a table every foot and squeeze as many people in? Maybe we can separate a little. Maybe people will start taking out food more and bringing it home. You know, maybe we will limit gatherings. There's no need to have so many people in such close proximity because that's how infections spread. And there's certainly th- things that we know about now that that seems that the risks are just not necessary. So I think we will get to a point where we will be out in society, but we're going to be more aware of people who are sick around us. I think hopefully a good take-home message for everyone is when you are not feeling well, stay at home because it does have consequences because you will spread your 
probably minor virus, but you don't know what it is. And we don't want things to spread in our community. Thanks to all of you. Um, we're, I'm always so humbled and feel so fortunate to be at Virginia Hospital Center with the team, the staff, the hospital staff, the medical staff that I get to work with each and every day. They put the patient first. Um, you know, I think we really do put the, the needs of the patient first here at Virginia Hospital Center. And that's always our guiding principle. Uh, is this best for our patients? And if the answer is yes, we're going to do that. And I think that philosophy has really uh, been exemplified here in the last couple of months as we've been dealing with this COVID pandemic. But I also want to thank all of you that are uh, on this call today, on this uh, video conference today, uh, all of you that have been part of those uh, foundation leadership calls. Uh, it's so heartening for all of us to know the support that's out there for us in the community. We really appreciate that. It, it keeps us all going each and every day as well. So thank you for your support. Thank you for your time. We really appreciate it, and we are proud to serve you and the whole community. Big thank you to our COVID-19 clinical panel. Now let's go to the fourth floor. Rich Krummenacher, take it away. Thank you, Tony. Now let's take a look at the progress of the construction here, the latest construction here at Virginia Hospital Center. It's hard to believe it's been 15 years since the tower opened up. And this is the, the first patient unit we've constructed since that tower opened up. Um, a part of being a nimble and forward-thinking hospital is to be adaptive to medical patient care. And what, and what we've done is we've incorporated a several, several of those items into this design with this project. Um, what I'll do is I'll take you through here to the rooms here, show you some components in there and some of the design components that we've done. So why don't you follow me in here to the room. So this is one of our new patient rooms. Obviously it's not constructed at this point. We're in progress. But we've taken advantage of this floor plate being 75% bigger than the rest of the uh, patient units in the tower by being able to have bigger rooms and bigger core areas and you have plenty of space to provide great patient care and ambulate around the room. So why don't we hop back out here and I can show you another component, design component we've incorporated that we've learned from past experiences is sound. Um, we have a, we've taken attenuation and sound masking into account to provide better patient experience. As you see right here, we've got an alcove that goes, in, goes into the rooms, um, which and sound absorption material above you, above you, which provides privacy and sound absorption. And it's a nice accent look too, with the wood paneling with the sound absorption below it. Um, and you can also see your high visibility here down up and down the hallways. Another component we've incorporated is with the pandemic going on, we said to ourselves, what else could we do to this unit to make us ready for future issues or future pandemics? And we got together with our design team and our construction team and said, hey, let's make this unit negative. And how do we do that? So we, and we turn this around rather quickly as we intercept the existing ductwork above us, put a fan on the roof, tie it into our building automation system, and do it all remotely. Someone could call our facility folks up, say, hey, I need you to turn all these rooms to negative. We press a button, it turns the whole unit negative, all the patient rooms negative, and provides, again, greater pa patient care, great patient care, and also protects the staff that's providing the care to them. So let's go take a look at what it's going to look like when it's done. I think we've got some renderings over here we can take a look at. Hello again. This is a video of the rendering what this patient unit is going to look like when it's completed construction-wise. Um, this is a visual coming in from the public elevators that you would actually walk into the unit. You can notice the, the artwork, the contemporary artwork on the wall, which is actually going to be the artwork that's on this unit. You've now come into the patient unit and you're greeted by a sub-nurses station right here. Looking down the hallway across to the other side of the unit, again notice the high ceilings, visibility on the unit. And we'll turn the corner here a little bit and come to the main nurses station. Looking down the hallway again, glass again all the way through, high ceilings. And come up to the side here and it, and it shows a very nice and clean look and well thought out look. So I hope you enjoyed, enjoyed the tour. I'm going to pass this over to my friend Melody. Thank you. Hello, I'm Melody Dickerson, Senior Vice President and Chief Nursing Officer here at Virginia Hospital Center. And I'm standing in the nurses station. You know, I really have to give Rich and the design team credit for really engaging the physicians and the nurses and every other ancillary department in this hospital 
every step of the way through the design process. I love that as huge as this nurse's station is, it seems very open and accessible to everyone. You're able to see all the way through. So in keeping with that theme of collaboration, you know, I love that through the design process, the nurses and the physicians were actually able to go into a mock room. And through that process, we were able to make slight changes that really enhanced the patient experience. So I wanna just say a heartfelt thanks to the physicians, nurses, and staff at Virginia Hospital Center who have been absolutely amazing through this entire pandemic that we've been going through. Through this entire process, they have maintained their professionalism, compassion, and drive to serve our patients in a way that has been truly heartwarming to watch. Now, while this environment will make us more efficient and more effective at delivering care, I also know that it's going to inspire us to do even better things in the future. So as we talk about the future, I'll toss it to Tony. Thanks, Melody. We look forward to seeing the finished product up on the fourth floor. But that's not all that's going on. Let's go to Charles Fletcher, Vice President for Construction Services, down at our construction site. On October 22, 2019, Virginia Hospital Center broke ground on its most ambitious project to date. The new parking structure will not only provide 1,700 parking spots, but it will also include a cafe and open green space. Look how far we've come since the groundbreaking, and this is just the beginning. I'm now standing at the bottom of the pit. We're about 95% completed with the excavation. We've taken out over 10,000 dump trucks. That's about 100,000 cubic yards of dirt. We're now in the process of laying footers in the garage, which is the foundation. Next, we're gonna be erecting, starting in September, 19,000 pieces of precast concrete. That's over 80 million pounds of concrete that's gonna be brought to the site starting in September and finishing in February of next year. Where we're standing right now is the parking structure. It's gonna add over 1,700 parking spaces to the campus. That's gonna make access easy for our patients and bring our staff back from off campus. The outpatient pavilion is a 245,000 square foot outpatient pavilion that makes access easy and care easy for our patients and for our visitors. There's imaging, there's surgery, and also private practices on the third, fourth, and fifth floor. Thanks, Charles. It's been great watching the progress on the construction site. Within a year, we'll have the parking deck available, and within two years, the outpatient pavilion should be completed and ready to serve the community. This is a great time to transition to Dr. Russ McQuay, Chairman of the Board, Virginia Hospital Center, Board of Directors. Dr. McQuay, can you share with us the importance of the construction of the outpatient pavilion from a strategic perspective as it relates to the quality of care and the overall patient experience. The thought process behind the uh, pavilion was to expand our current um, offerings to the community. Uh, we have been gradually growing over the last uh, uh, 30 years, which is how long I've been here for, and uh, we've continually outgrown the space. No matter what building we open up, it seems like three or four months after it's open, it's full and we're looking at creating more rooms inside the building. Uh, we've been uh, sort of landlocked on the current campus and uh, that's limited us as far as both parking and uh, space availability for physicians and different services of the hospital. So the, the uh, decision to be made was whether we expand in a total different direction or whether we try and do something that's contiguous with the, with the campus. And when the county uh, decided to close its property next door, it seemed like the optimal way to go. And uh, it allowed us to do a land swap with the uh, county for uh, South Arlington property, which benefited the, the Arlington County. And it gave us the contiguous land that we needed to uh, enhance our services. So we embarked into a fairly, uh, big enterprise, and uh, not least of which was increased on campus parking, which has been sort of a, um, a continued uh, 
issue for us to deal with um, just because the number of patients coming here has continually increased. And when you think about all the staff that requires uh, on campus just, just to support the offices and then having the additional space you need to uh, afford parking to the, to the patrons, uh, we kind of reached our maximum capacity. So uh, the, the current project is basically in two phases, the first part of which is going to be the parking garage, and it's going to quadruple our current parking space. And uh, we're going to open that within the next year, hopefully, and uh, that will uh, take a lot of burden off our current parking and really enhance uh, the services we currently provide. And then a year after that will be when the entire pavilion opens up and that will expand all of our outpatient services. As you know, there are uh, capabilities for uh, surgical suites. The first floor is all diagnostic imaging with laboratory services. And then in the upper floors, we'll have room for additional office space for physicians and other services uh, such as an infusion center. Um, we're really looking forward to it. I think it's going to enhance the services we have on campus, not only for the outpatients, but it's also going to uh, open a lot of uh, additional space within the current hospital building, which will allow us to expand our inpatient capability. Uh, we'll have an additional entire floor, which will be another 40 plus rooms to add if we need it. And that's just an example of we're currently opening additional floors right now, and I'm sure as soon as they're open, they're going to be full. So we'll be looking towards the additional space. Dr. McQuay, you serve in two roles here, as a physician, but also as the chairman of the board of the hospital. Can you share with us why you believe it's so important that Virginia Hospital Center remains an independent health system? Y yes, um, the hospital has been independent the entire time that I've been here. When I originally came to the area and looked at different job opportunities in the region, one of the things that attracted me to this hospital was the fact that it was uh, a, a closed uh, shop that we could manage ourselves. It allows us to be more nimble in the way we attack problems that arise, uh, the current uh, COVID crisis being one of them. We're able to adjust the way we do things quickly we're not dependent on a, a higher corporate structure that we have to pass our ideas through. And that allows us to address a problem, discuss it with everybody um, that we need to, and actually implement the changes sometimes same day. Uh, I think uh, that allows us also to have this personal touch that I'm talking about too, and that everybody that works here knows each other. Everybody that works here knows that they can approach anybody in the hospital. And that allows us to really work on things from a personal perspective. I think not only does it give the patient a feeling of uh, closeness to the staff, but it also allows the staff to have that same closeness with everybody that works in the hospital. That way you develop a team that really cares about what they're doing, that looks for opportunities to improve the care they provide to people and it has really um, resulted in us having a top-notch uh, medical center that is really valued for the quality we provide to our community. So in closing, Dr. McQuay, what would you tell a community member who wants to be involved to ensure that Virginia Hospital Center continues to grow, continues to innovate, to meet the changing needs of health care for our community? Uh, that's a broad question and there are a lot of capabilities that the community people have that can help our hospital. I think uh, recent events have really shown that and we've had members of the community do everything from sew surgical masks for us to wear, to provide lunches for us to, to eat and on a regular basis that occurs. We have people that continually email us and ask us are there things we can do to help out? I think for the people that can afford direct support, that's great. It's certainly appreciated by everybody at the hospital. And I think for those that can provide us financial support, that's also important because in the end, when we go through uh, uh, different challenges like we are right now, 
it's, it's important for us to be financially stable as well as operationally stable. One of the uh, uh, goals that we set out with this current uh, project is that we wanted to take care of all the acutely ill people, but we also wanted to provide for the uh, non-COVID people that also need medical care and to protect them while they're in the hospital having that care. I think thirdly though, is we wanted to protect our staff and recognize our staff for all the work they do. We wanted to keep them healthy, but we also wanted to keep them employed. And one of the uh, uh, goals that we set out is to maintain our staff so that they, they would appreciate um, the value of this hospital. They would feel appreciated for the services that they provide. And I'm happy to report that we've been able to do that through this entire crisis and we've not laid off a single person. Thank you, Dr. Russ McQuay, for your time this afternoon. It was a pleasure to be here, Tony, and I wanted to take the opportunity to thank you as well uh, for all the efforts you put into informing the community of exactly what's happening here at the hospital and all the interactions you've had with the foundation that help us uh, provide the services that we continue to provide. It's my pleasure to introduce Diane and Rick Pollack, Grateful Patients of Virginia Hospital Center and longtime Arlington residents. Diane and Rick, thanks for taking time to join us today. Hi, I'm Rick Pollack, and as you can tell from this accent, it's a Brooklyn, New York accent, but I've lived here in Arlington, as Diane often reminds me, for over 35 years. And uh, I'm very glad to be here and part of the Virginia Hospital Center family. Hi, my name is Diane Pollack. I'm a lifelong Arlington resident. I've lived here my entire life other than college and Virginia Hospital Center is very important to us. One of the things uh, as president and CEO of the American Hospital Association I often get asked in a variety of different forums is, hey you know everyone, where do you get your care? You can go anywhere. And my response is always my local community hospital, uh, the Virginia Hospital Center. I have great confidence in them and uh, I've been a loyal patient to them as my family has over the years. On the Protect the Heroes Fund, uh, when the pandemic began to hit, uh, we found that there was an outpouring of support uh, for our frontline healthcare heroes. The nurses, the doctors, the physical therapists, uh, the respiratory therapists, uh, the people that uh, keep the rooms clean and serve the food. And uh, a lot of people in this country wanted to help. And thanks to the American Association of Health Philanthropy and the Creative Coalition, which is an organization that represents a lot of actors, uh, they created this fund. And this fund really is a way in which people can go to a portal uh, across the country, select their individual local hospital, and make a contribution to them uh, to help us, uh, particularly when it comes to purchasing protective, personal protective equipment. Uh, which was uh, at one point a, a very uh, scarce item and it continues to be a concern in terms of our supply chain. Uh, we were also pleased that the Major League Baseball Association, the Players Association, not only gave an endorsement but a substantial contribution as well. In addition to that, uh, and this one really was interesting, the National Bobblehead Museum uh, produced bobbleheads of Dr. Anthony Fauci and they dedicated uh, literally a portion of uh, whoever bought those bobbleheads uh, to the Protect the Heroes Fund and they've helped us raise uh, over $100,000. So it's a way for everyone uh, across the nation to express not only their recognition and their thanks uh, to healthcare workers, but also a way to help them. I uh, began uh, my time here in Arlington, 1955. And by then it was a small hospital. Now it's, I think, four times as large. Um, still a community hospital, even though it's a fabulous, well-known hospital, still my hometown hospital. It's our local community hospital, and that's why we rely on it for the care of ourselves and our entire family. Having something close by that you know is going to give you good care is always accessible and a very reassuring feeling that you can come in when you need something and know you'll be taken care of. Can I just add that uh, I've also been a patient here on several occasions and it's always been a positive experience. Uh, not only have I always had good medical outcomes, which is key,
but the staff is just phenomenal. Um, everybody you, well, you encounter um, uh, brings a, a passion for uh, quality care and is absolutely committed, friendly, and caring. Um, and that really starts from the top with leadership in this organization and the great leadership that Jim Cole provides because he helps create that kind of culture along with so many of the leaders in this organization. Um, that's why this, uh, this hospital is so special. And if I could just say one more thing about that, we've been here, like I said, my entire life. I've had my parents, obviously, were here when I was growing up. Rick's mother has come to visit us from Brooklyn. We have children, we have grandchildren. All four generations of our family have been here at one time or another, and every time we've had quality care, good outcomes, as Rick said, but also you really feel like you're part of a family, and that goes a long way to helping get you into a better frame of mind for health. Thanks, Diane and Rick. Your message of it takes a community really rings true. And I can't think of anybody better to talk about the importance of community as it relates to Virginia Hospital Center than Dave Townsend. Dave's a longtime volunteer leader and currently serves as the chairman of the foundation board here at VHC. Dave? And thanks, Tony, and hello. Uh, my hope is that this finds you and your families safe and healthy. The pandemic has impacted us all, some obviously way more than others. And yet, despite the chaos and despite the stress and uncertainty on when all this would end, there have been some positives, some, as the common expression goes, silver linings. For many of us, the pace of our lives has slowed. We've reconnected with old friends to see how they're doing. Many have used this downtime to tackle projects around the house, do puzzles, play games, Zoom calls, Zoom birthday parties, read books, a variety of different activities. Many families have seen their adult children move back home temporarily and work remote. And while these things may seem small and insignificant today, I think they are what we are going to be talking about and remembering many years from now. The crisis has made us much more aware of just how fortunate we are to have Virginia Hospital Center right here in our own backyard especially given the news coverage that detailed the horrific conditions that existed at many hospitals around the country. In the early days of the pandemic, friends would ask, how is Virginia Hospital Center doing? And I would tell them some of what you've just heard. That Jim Cole and his team of senior leaders, doctors and nurses came together quickly and developed a rapid response plan. That in a matter of days, a remote testing facility was built and opened to take the pressure off of the emergency room that the hospital had an adequate supply of personal protection equipment, and that the hospital had access to best practices through its unique relationship with the Mayo Clinic. That morale was very high despite the long hours and risks to one's personal health, and that the hospital had been hit hard financially due to the ban on electable surgeries and the added expenses of fighting the virus. And I think most importantly that the entire community had come together to show their support by donating thousands of meals, sending letters, posting signs, and making very generous financial contributions. I explained that more than 350 people had made their very first gift to Virginia Hospital Center as a part of the COVID-19 appeal, and that this effort helped raise more than $700,000. And I also mentioned how proud I was. My affiliation with this hospital goes back 34 years. All three of our children were born here. And I told them that I had never been more prouder. Now we know that a great hospital doesn't just happen. It takes a strong leadership team that embraces a culture of quality and that is patient-centered and that understands that success is never final, that there is always a better way it takes best-in-class doctors and nurses who have access to state-of-the-art medical equipment and technology. This is Virginia Hospital Center. And as important, it takes an engaged and con connected community, one that values excellence in healthcare and how through philanthropic support they are investing in the future. This too is Arlington County and the surrounding area. 
Jim Cole mentioned earlier that it's all about community coming together to help make a difference. Your generous giving helps Virginia Hospital Center remain an independent nonprofit community hospital. It helps with the design and construction of the new outpatient pavilion. It helps fund the outpatient clinic and the pediatric center that provide care for the community's most vulnerable. And it also is absolutely critical in our ability to attract and retain best in class doctors and nurses who have access to state-of-the-art medical equipment and technology. We all have an opportunity to invest in the future and create a lasting difference. And so I invite you to join me in making the hospital one of your top three charities this year. It is absolutely so critical and vital to the sustainability of Virginia Hospital Center. And so stay healthy and stay safe and thank you. Well, thanks, Dave. And that now concludes the presentation part of our program today. And over the last 45, 50 minutes, we've had questions coming in. So let's take the opportunity now to do some Q&A. Thank you. Well, we've got a few questions out here. And I think uh, we've had over 100 people participate in this streaming meeting today. First question. I think I'm going to ask Dr. DeLisi this question. What's the biggest aha moment or biggest surprise with regard to treating and caring for COVID-19 patients? I think it's been a, uh, a very interesting process over the last several months to see how uh, our care has developed and things that we were doing before we we've, we've changed and responded to evidence coming out uh, in the medical literature and certainly with the uh, leadership of my physician colleagues over here it's been a continuously evolving process so uh, I think it's just been amazing to watch the medical community come together um, so quickly uh, and cohesively over the last couple months to develop best practices to develop recommendations for taking better and better care of these patients. Thank you, Dr. DeLisi. We have um, other mem members of our panel here, so I was gonna thank, I'd like to have a follow-on question, uh, or follow-on statement from Dr. Modak. Dr. Modak, would you like to add a few comments? Sure, thank you. You know, I think Dr. DeLisi said it best that our medical staff came together, came together very well. But to really answer the question, that didn't surprise me. I know my colleagues, I know who I work with, I know the hospital we're in and the staff here. And I've seen it over and over again, that we come together and we do exceptional work for our patients, our staff, our community. The real surprise, quite honestly, was the, the devastation of COVID-19, that people were dying, that healthy people were dying. And this is something, yes, we've read about, but. I haven't seen this before. They say this was like the early days of HIV. You know, in my 15 years of practice, I have not seen something like this, where we had people coming in our hospital, where we had dozens and dozens of patients, and we never knew what was going to happen to each patient. And we all did our best, and despite our best efforts, sometimes things didn't go the way we wanted them to go. And that really, it, it, it's, it's surprising, even though we know that's what medicine is, that's not the medicine I certainly expect. It's not what our colleagues have been delivering. And obviously it's not within our hands. It makes me take a step back and pause and, and think about the humanity of every patient who walks in. And we need to continue to do our best to really help everyone. It's, it's a tough situation. Thank you, Dr. Modak. I think the following question I was gonna ask is someone that got texted to me. So, do we see a second wave coming? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask uh, Dr. P to answer that question if we could. Um, yes, yes, I, I think we do see a second wave coming. You know, as we enter stage two and stage three, we'll interact a lot more. In the fall, schools will open up. And while we know that um, children do very well with COVID, once children start school, adult interactions with other people triple. 
Um, so I think it's reasonable to expect that the numbers will go up, uh, whether you call that a second ra wave or just an increase in the rates that we're seeing, it's going to happen to some degree. Uh, certainly, you know, schools and businesses are working to mitigate those risks. And I think if we continue to really focus on mitigating those risks with masks and meticulous hand hygiene and really truly practicing social distancing, we can blunt those numbers, but uh, you know, we should be prepared for an increase compared to what we're seeing right now. Thank you. And this, this other question got texted to me was specific to Dr. Lew Dr. Lewis. Uh, Dr. Lewis, will you send your sons back to college this fall? They are going back to college this fall. <laughs> and I'm hoping they're not gonna return soon. <laughs> Although I worry about it because I do think that there's gonna be a, a significant second wave. Um, and, and the kids going to school is gonna be a, a significant impact on all of us, as Jennifer just described. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. That was an inside question. Um, the next question is for uh, Charles. And the question is, is parking really going to be better? Will they keep the other parking lots open too? Parking's a big issue here in Arlington in general, certainly here at the hospital. You were down in the pit showing everybody the, the big hole. Is it really going to help or is it just, is this really just all for show? No, the parking's absolutely going to be better. Uh, when you think of our campus now, we have about 2,500 parking spaces on our current campus. We're adding another 1,700 parking spaces. And it's just some additional design features. You know, the outpatient pavilion and the garage were both built with the patient first in mind, uh, just like our clinical care is. And so when you, go to t when you go to Tyson's Mall and you see there's space available on every level and you also have those LED lights in every space that shows you if the space is open or closed, so that's, uh, or it's available or it's not available. So I think that's one additional aspect we'll have for our parking that will enhance it. Not only will the patient have a direct access into the garage, they'll know what level they can go to to find a space. And then once they're on the level, they'll actually be able to find the exact space that's available on that level. So, and we're also gonna keep all the other garages open as well. Thank you very much. Next question I have is uh, for Rich. Rich, you, you had an opportunity to talk about the uh, size of the rooms um, uh, being bigger, but what does that necessarily mean? Just having a, what's the feature about having a bigger room that actually benefits the patient? Well, a bigger room is gonna provide a better experience, better patient experience, and it's um, gonna provide more space to ambulate around and for family members and visitors to come in, and also for nursing staff to be able to provide better care. We can bring in a lot of that state-of-the-art medical equipment we brought in and not have the room filled up with things because we have more space, bring more things in, provide better care, um, overall better patient experience. That's right. The, the equipment's gotten so much bigger now in rooms. Um, really, when, once the room's full of equipment, there's, it's really difficult for the caregiver to really move around the room. So that's great. Uh, another question that's come in, uh, if I'm told that I have COVID-19, uh, I'm COVID-19 positive, uh, what do I have to do when it comes to telling people? Or, or will a contact tracer help with that? I'm probably going to be feeling bad. I don't have the energy to go get to the phone to see who's where and at what time. So this sounds like a very personal question. And uh, I think I'm going to ask um, uh, Dr. DeLisi uh, again to uh, address this if you can. It's a kind of a very specific question. But uh, we'll start with you and then uh, we can go to the other, our other physicians. Thanks, Tony. So if you are told that you're COVID-19 positive, the most important thing is for you to stay at home. Um, usually we recommend about it's two weeks after symptoms uh, have stopped. Um, we want to make sure that you're clear that you won't transmit that to anyone else. Now, one of the interesting things about COVID-19 and one of the things that makes it really challenging for us is actually about 40 to 50% of people that get it won't have any symptoms. Now, presumably, if you're positive, you may have had some symptoms, but even out of those people that have some symptoms, a lot of them are kind of mild. Uh, so we would certainly recommend that you let people know that you've been in contact with over the last 10 days or so to say, hey, I'm COVID positive, so that they can also isolate at their home and not spread it to anyone else. Thank you very much, Dr. Delisi. I'm going to go back here to our infectious disease experts and clinical care experts. Uh, Dr. Modak, did you have any, anything else to add to that? Thank you. 
So ideally, the county health department will get in contact with you, will get in contact with everyone you've been in touch with and do the contact tracing. But there are shortages. And throughout the entire state, and this is every state, but specifically in Virginia, they're looking to hire people to do contact tracing. Jobs are available. If you know anyone needs a job, go to vdh.gov and, and apply for it because that would greatly help. In the meantime, if you're sick, you need to get better. It's, it would be nice. It's not your responsibility to call everyone you could possibly have been in contact with over the last few weeks. But certainly, if there's someone you work in close contact with, that person is at risk. And I would suggest that you do have someone get in contact with that person to stay at home, to quarantine themselves for two weeks. Because that's the problem. That's how this virus is spreading. That you've been near someone, that person has been near someone, and so forth and so forth. Thank you, Dr. Modak. Will there be a safer time for high-risk patients um, to do those delayed procedures? Dr. McQuay, you had talked about that a little bit earlier, so I'm going to direct this question to you, if I could. Well, that's a, a hard question to answer because the, uh, the situation changes almost daily. But I think right now, um, as the data showed that Dr. Delisi had reviewed, uh, we, we are in a very, very safe environment here at the hospital. And as a matter of fact, you're less likely to contract the disease here at the hospital than you are in the, in the uh, general public. So as people said, if you have an issue, uh, a medical problem that needs to be addressed, you need to come to the hospital and have it addressed. And it's a safe time to do that now. Thank you, Dr. McQuay. <clears throat> Has the pandemic affected any of the outpatient pavilion project? Changes in the designer layout, and what about the fourth floor? What adjustments, if any, uh, need to be in light of the pandemic? So, Charles, that's a multi-pronged question. Uh, we talked a lot about the outpatient pavilion this afternoon, but I think people still want to be convinced that um, you guys are working over here, even though we're in the midst of a pandemic. So, do you want to let us know how things are going? Yeah, so uh, it currently has not delayed anything in the project. Uh, Skanska, who is our uh, construction uh, partner with this, has uh, kind of immediately implemented kind of best practices and, and social distancing with their workers. We're actually in a lucky phase of the project where there's not a lot of close interaction. So most of the workers are they're doing the excavation and they're laying concrete. So there's not a lot of uh, carpentry work or finishing work, which would be a little bit challenge, uh, a little bit more challenging for that. So we've been lucky in that sense. So for the outpatient pavilion, we're uh, on schedule for both the garage and the outpatient pavilion. And I think for the fourth floor, as Richard uh, had mentioned uh, when he was up there, that one of the things we were able to do kind of timely was change the engineering of the floor so that each one of those rooms could be made negative pressure, um, which helps with isolation, helps with our staff safety and with uh, patient care as well. Thank you, Charles. Um, I had a question for Melody about our nurses. You know, you talked a little bit about how the nurse station over on the fourth floor is is really going to be open and, and be much more conducive to in, engaging the, the nurses being able to engage and see through and be much more efficient with their time. That's great, but that's not going to open up probably till the end of the summer or early fall. And we're still dealing in this pandemic environment. So would you mind just sharing with us how, how your, how's your nursing team's doing, you know, from an emotional perspective? Because we've been into this thing now more than 12 weeks. So thanks, thanks for asking, Tony. The nurses, I think, in general, are, are doing very well. They have certainly felt the support of this community and the gifts that have been given. Uh, I think uh, they're gonna, it's going to take a little getting used to not having lunch every day uh, provided to them. <laughs> uh, but no, I, you know, I round um, quite a bit. And I would say that you know, I'm just so very proud of, of this entire team. And we're getting used to a new normal. Um, our numbers are less than a third of, of what they were several months ago. And so it's, it's now, it's like you finished the war, uh, but there's still a few little battles to go. And so we've got to, you know, kind of get back to normal, the new normal, uh, which is COVID, uh, and, and keeping that eye forward, as, as the physicians have mentioned already, about, you know, the risk of, of a... Of a uh, second wave coming um, sometime later on right now. It's giving people some time to, to take a little break and a breath, uh, a little time off uh, to regather themselves and um, recharge their batteries so that, um, you know, we'll be ready for what comes. 
when you have the best nurses in the state, we want to make sure they're, they're well fed, well hydrated, yeah. and they get a little vacation this summer. Yeah. So the next question that came in, uh, this is interesting, timely, um, as it relates to safety. Uh, the question is, I'm thinking about ordering a face shield as discussed in the Wednesday article of the Wall Street Journal. Are face shields safe for the mass? And because I like to smile and this will allow me to do so. So that's interesting as this is all evolving. You know, one of the challenges that we have is that you can't see people's expressions on their faces. And the idea that people are miscommunicating because um, that's such a big part of the way we interact. Um, so I think what I'd like to do is I'm gonna go right back to my, uh, my, my doctors in a row here. And I'm gonna start with Dr. Lewis because you're closest to me. Um, what, what is your take on face shields versus masks? So I did not see the article yesterday in the Wall Street Journal, but generally the, fa the, the face shield is going to start in the forehead and then go down over the face. And this will not actually adequately cover the mouth and kind of the particles that we're in the respiratory particles that are coming out. And so that is the kind of thing that would be used in addition, usually in addition to a mask, not instead of a mask. Although I, I do appreciate the smiling part. Absolutely. So it's really about the mask is uh, the, the shield is really about protecting the eyes, which is another point of entry for the infection. Uh, so Dr. Modak, do you have uh, a view on this? So Dr. Lewis is exactly right. It's about protecting or covering the mouth. This is going to prevent transmission. That's the point of the mask. That's what's going to keep us all safe. Again, social distancing, wearing a mask, and hygiene, hand hygiene. These three things are things we can all do and we should be doing and that will help protect all of us in the community. Thank you, Dr. Modak. Are there lessons that you're learning which are going to impact change the way the hospital delivers care to patients with other conditions or patients in general? And um, so I think, uh, Dr. DeLisi, I'm, as I'm walking over there, I wanna direct this to you since you're our chief medical officer. Um, uh, we, you mentioned we've learned, learned a lot over the last 100 days as it relates to the infection. But really, how is the, this affecting how we deliver care for all the other uh, patients? It's a, it's a great question. I think, you know, in the current environment, uh, and, you know, as I think Melody described it as the new normal, um, there are things that are different now than what they, are, than they were before. We're all wearing masks here in this room. I think we'll all be wearing masks for some period of time, certainly into the future. And, you know, I think a couple of the most interesting, one of the most interesting statistics, there were one of the most interesting trends that came out of this is when uh, the sort of shutdown started in March, the flu activity went to essentially zero. And so what we know from that, you know, coming down so quickly is if everybody's doing a really good job at washing their hands, you know, wearing masks, just being really careful with infection prevention practices, you can really get rid of a lot of infectious disease very, very quickly and very effectively. So I think that this real um, uh, focus on hand hygiene, which was already existent in hospitals, but I think there's been just a huge focus on it, not just with our hospital staff, but everyone coming through the hospital can really help to, to limit the spread of not just COVID, but other infectious diseases moving forward. Thank you so much, Dr. DeLisi. And uh, I don't want our CEO, Mr. Cole, to be feeling left out. He's sitting back here all by himself and we're asking all these questions of our clinical leaders and construction leaders. And, and so I wanted to have this question come to you. Uh, it says his neighbor, um, neighbor's a CEO of a local business and she's asked, how can we help? Um, what should we tell businesses and families who wanna help Virginia Hospital Center right now? Well, Tony, I think realistically at this point in time, as we've noted, there's been so much community support in terms of uh, physical offerings, food, uh, uh, even preparing masks. I think we're at a point, frankly, where any business or any individual who wants to help going forward should seriously consider donating to the foundation. Was that the correct answer? Yes, 100%. But we... Uh, we really are in the situation where, um, as was noted, not only is there significant additional expense related to all the PPE, et cetera, but uh, revenues are dramatically affected negatively, uh, even this month in June, uh, because we're 
probably at about 60% of uh, our emergency room visits that we typically expect, uh, similar for outpatient surgeries, et cetera. Uh, revenue from various sources is down. And it, it would make a huge difference going forward if individuals choose to donate uh, to the foundation and ongoing efforts here. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Cole. And that's going to be uh, bringing in our last question to Rick. As President of the American Hospital Association, you have a national perspective of what's going on, and you've talked, you and Diane have talked so uh, eloquently, um, eloquently this afternoon about your relationship with Virginia Hospital Center. But when you take a look at what we're doing here compared to what's going on across the country, how, how do you feel what's going on right here in your hometown? I feel really good about it, and uh, one of the things that's been alluded to earlier that I think is really important is that this organization has taken every precaution necessary to allow people to come back to get the care that they need uh, in terms of non-emergent services and elective surgeries or elective procedures. And I myself, over the past couple of weeks, have had, had a couple of things checked out, and I felt totally comfortable coming here to get the care that I needed. And I think everybody should feel that way um, because they've put in place everything to keep people safe, as well as the staff. Well, th thank you so much, uh, Rick and Diane. Thank you to all the clinicians and administrators here at Virginia Hospital Center for doing this briefing today for all our stakeholders across Northern Virginia in the metropolitan Washington, D.C. where uh, we couldn't be more pleased uh, to be of service to the community, our region, and if you, need, uh, if you need care, I think the message is clear. Get back to your doctor's office, and we hope you'll come visit us here at Virginia Hospital Center. Thank you very much, and have a good rest of your day. Goodbye.